Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television here on The Point of View. We get the right guests. We ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. It's an interactive show. If you're watching on television, you can send your questions and comments on the WhatsApp number on the screen. If you're watching on social media, please feel free to comment on the stream below. So we are in the month of May, and it's very, very close to election 2020. But this is a different election, not least because of COVID-19. In every typical election year, this would have been a time where we are following political parties across the country. But in Ghana, we are still discussing a voter's register and whether to even do a new register or not. There was a major IPAC meeting held earlier today at which the largest opposition party decided to boycott. Tonight, I'll be speaking to the General Secretary of the Opposition, NDC General Johnson, Asirun Ketia, and later I'll speak to the EC about what happened today. We'll be right back. So welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight we have the General of Ghana Politics, uh, Johnson Asidun Ketia, NDC General Secretary. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you very much, Bernard. It's good to have you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. To we, we are neighbors in Adabraka, but we hardly, we hardly, <laughs> in fact, you can even walk to this place <laughs> to say anything you want, but it's very difficult to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. <laughs> Great. You yeah. should have been at an IPAC meeting, which happened earlier in the day, but yeah. the party didn't go. Just yeah. walk us through why you decided that it wasn't the right platform or you thought it wasn't a fair meeting, therefore you boycotted it? Well, thank you very much. First of all, it is our uh, belief that IPAC has lost its significance because uh, there's a reason why IPAC was established. Mm. It was established out of the belief in Ghana that electoral rules are best established through consensus. So from 1994 to 2016, mm -hmm. all the reforms that uh, we have undertaken as a country mm -hmm. had their origin from IPAC deliberations. So whenever we are making any law that governs elections, uh, we have IPAC committees, uh, technical committees, mm -hmm. uh, legal committees that will help in the drafting, bring it for IPAC to agree mm -hmm. before it is sent to parliament for enactment. That is why many of our laws, when they find themselves in parliament, the debate is very, very minimal because the debate happens actually between the stakeholders at mm -hmm. IPAC. Mm -hmm. But uh, so as part of this, you remember we've gone through several changes from opaque ballot boxes to transparent ballot boxes, from no um, um, voter ID card to picture-based voter ID card, and many, 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 many of them. And then uh, by 2013, 2014, following a uh, directive from the Supreme Court, we managed to put together a committee that drafted a roadmap for, um, you know, electoral reform. And we had stuck to the roadmap from 2014 to 2016. Then the commission got uh, reshuffled and everything we have done in the past, uh, things that are arrived at by consensus at IPAC, they've all been thrown to the dogs and the new com uh, commission comes and then they are doing whatever they are doing. Anytime anybody wants an input into uh, decision making, they just refer to their, their powers under the constitution that they are, they, are not, they are independent and so they won't listen to anybody. So since IPAC is a contrivance for consensus building and the electoral commission has demonstrated that they don't need consensus. They take their decisions according to the powers vested in them and then bring the decisions up. We felt that if they want to communicate to us, they have other means of communication through letter writing, emails, and so on. So if you are going to sit there for the commission to just tell you what they have planned to do and you don't have any way of influencing it. So how does a typical IPAC meeting in the past happen? So that what makes this one different? In the past, you had uh, development partners represented, you had civil society represented, and all political parties represented by at least three persons. Okay. And then when an issue is tabled, we are allowed to share our opinions and we may even arrive at conclusions that may be different from what the Electoral Commission uh, proposes to do. And once they know that all the parties, stakeholders are at Edom, 
with uh, a, a particular way of doing things, and it is not against any specific law, they will adopt what we have proposed and we move forward. So we never even voted at IPAC. It is always discussion, discussion that will arrive through consensus. And that is why I have narrated a litany of reforms that have been arrived through this particular procedure. Now you have an IPAC where um, you go and then Electoral Commission comes to announce what they propose to do and then whatever you say is just uh, overboard. Nobody takes any suggestion from any political party. But what made this particular IPAC completely different was that uh, we all know we are in a, a difficult situation. Now, the president had issued Executive Instrument 64, which says that all social gatherings are suspended. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they have listed specific um, uh, institutions or type of social gatherings that are permitted. And they've uh, indicated that those are essential services. Electoral services have not been listed by the president as essential services. So were there when we had an invitation letter, which was asking us, I even have a yeah, copy here, copy. yeah. A letter inviting us to IPAC, and then, uh, you can have a look at it. Inviting us to IPAC, you will see that they are detecting that the IPAC should be, every party will be represented by one person, and then, uh, uh, Again, they are saying that due to the directive of the president of not having social gatherings exceeding 25 persons, mm -hmm. the IPAC meeting has been divided into two groups. This mm -hmm. is actually the March 25 Yes, meeting. and the, the, the current one is also along the same lines. Yes. I also have that one. But at the time, I recall the president did say that private funerals can be held but not exceeding 25 persons, yes. which I believe is what they are drawing. But it is private funeral. We are not going to IPAC to bury anybody. The 25 relates to private burials. That's all. The law is very specific. And this matter has been ruled upon by a high court. Recently? Yes, because when, uh, you remember when um, Ningo Pram Pram MP went to court to seek an injunction. Mate George, someone Mate George. Yes, the ruling was very specific. The judge explained that the 25 relates to private barriers. And it doesn't relate to any other meetings. So there is a misconception that people think that any other meetings can happen so long as the membership is less than 25. That is wrong. So, I mean, I just been... so you're saying that for you, this meeting could have happened with more than 25 people? No. Or it shouldn't happen at all because we are not a funeral. So in your view, a meeting yeah. should not happen. It's only funerals that are capped at 25. Just to be clear on your, your position. You can what read is our response. When we had the invitation, the response we gave to the electoral commission. We are of the opinion that, uh, uh, first of all, these meetings should not happen at all. If the electoral commission believes that we are an essential service, all they need to do is to submit a memo to the president reminding him that we have this thing. If we are not allowed to continue, then there could be this uh, constitutional crisis, so they should list us in the law as essential services. Then we can do our meetings as normally as possible at, the, uh, at IPAC. They haven't done that. And we said that, okay, if we are even assuming that it was an oversight on the part of the president and that we want to behave as if we are an essential services, kindly allow the three uh, representative for political parties to come and then you go uh, acquire a bigger space so that if all of us are present in one meeting then we can observe the social distance and the discussions can go on and you say no we are breaking the parties into two groups the same meeting same issues to be discussed in phase one then they will close and go home. Then the phase two will come and so you take... What is your fear about that? The fact that... What's your fear it about It is the not that possible that any such meeting can happen for us to agree on anything. Happen. Because, well, if first group agrees that the things should be A, mm -hmm. and the second group say that it should be B, so are you going to call the first group to also discuss the second group's opinion with them before, uh, so that you'll be doing a series of meetings left, right, center? And again... 
it does not lie in the power of electoral commission to decide the number of representatives for any political party because this is a subject we have discussed and agreed upon and documented that each political party should have three representatives. So you just, without discussing with anybody, you just write a letter, say, everybody, I will allow only one representative. Again, the meeting will be divided into two groups. First group will go and, and hold their discussion. Then in the afternoon, second group. Have you seen any but, meeting but, happen but, like you know, that? Some will say that there, might, there must be deeper issues than the form of a meeting for which you are boycotting it. Mm -hmm. So that maybe you are boy the form of the meeting reveals something deeper to you. Because yeah. I'm sure that sure. in the first group there's NDC, MPP, CPP, mm -hmm. and if whoever goes for NDC mm -hmm. can defend themselves adequately. So surely there must be underlying reasons why you are boycotting this meeting beyond the issue of the, the grouping. There may be underlying reason, but let me tell you the reason why one person cannot represent a political party. The issues about the voters' register, they cut across legal issues. There are technical issues, ICT issues. Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, if you are taking a decision, you must have somebody who has capacity to commit the political party. So when we're given three slots, we, uh, either the chairman or general secretary will be present. I have power to commit NDC. The national chairman has power to commit NDC. Then we will send a director of ICT mm -hmm. so that when we are discussing issues about ICT, he's there handy, but he cannot commit NDC. Then we, we uh, at times, send a lawyer mm -hmm. so that if there are legal issues, he also comes in handy. You understand? So you, you are in a meeting fully prepared. So wherever the issues are, you are prepared to uh, you know, uh, proceed to a decision-making point. So if you call me now, and I go as general secretary, sit there, and uh, uh, I'm deficient in ICT uh, uh, issues, and you say we should discuss the types of technologies we will be applying, I need backstopping. So it becomes a problem. If I don't go and I send the uh, director of ICT, mm. he may understand the issues, but when it comes to decision making, he cannot commit to the party. So why would electoral commission, without prior discussion with anybody, decide on their own that a party should be represented by one person? Okay. It beats any imagination. But are, there we, are deeper issues. There are deeper uh, uh, issues. Yeah, we'll come to that. I understand that the outcome of today's IPAC meeting is that mm -hmm. registration will start late June. Mm -hmm and end late July. Mm -hmm. EC have recruited and trained people for the registration. Mm -hmm. They've also done a test run of their system mm -hmm. and they are waiting for the maturation of the CI. <laughs> Let me just ask a hypothetical question. Assuming the IPAC meeting today were held mm -hmm. in the traditional form, mm -hmm. three people, all of you, mm -hmm. could you have stopped this outcome I've just, I've just told sure, you? Sure, if we are to discuss it properly, this timetable is unrealistic. So Anybody we have voted, appoint, well, how does it work? Does we it, would have is it looked based on the strength of the arguments or the number of people who choose one side? No, it's not the number of people. We have never voted at IPAC. You discuss the issues. Okay. If you know that uh, it will take maybe 20, 30 days to do registration, Electoral Commission will agree with you because the calibration about how many people we are going to capture per registration center how many minutes it takes to capture one person. When you calculate those things, you are able to come to a conclusion that it is not possible to capture maybe 18 million within this time at this point. So the electoral commission will come with open mind and you all go through the systems and you take a decision as to where that discussion leads you. It is not like this commission that comes and then come and impose something on you. You talk to them about uh, the impossibility of some of the things they say, we have power, we have taken our decision. That's the point. Because have they indicated when the register will be ready? Well, what the, the information we have from the meeting is what mm -hmm. I'm putting out to you, that June is when, late June is when the mm -hmm. uh, registration will start, mm -hmm. end late July. So mm -hmm. then, of course, they have to then put the register together. I don't have that information here. Uh -huh. But so, the, uh, when you are doing these things, you need to calibrate the various activities 
that have timelines from now to the election day. There is a time for you to get your register ready. The register must be ready before filing of nominations. Mm -hmm. a filing of nominations must happen. There must be, the register must be ready before transfer of votes, before preparation of special voters list. And by law, they all have their time frame. They must happen, in some cases, 42 days before the election and so on. So if by uh, 42 days to the election, the register is not ready, you are in crisis. The filing of nomination must happen within a certain time frame. So, and there must be a ready register based upon which you can file nomination. You cannot file nomination when registration is going on. So if registration is not complete and you don't have a complete voters register, how are you going to file nomination? That okay. is also a problem. We will ask the EC the questions you've raised about if they are ending late July, how would they do all these things before you can still deliver on December 7th? Yes. Now, some say, irrespective of what register is used, I think mm -hmm. there was a question about which register is used, mm -hmm. it's seven months from election. The issue should be focusing more on how to campaign because you've won elections with all kinds of registers, as have MPP. So... With the, 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 this discussion about what's happening with the CI and co are not as germane as what the people of Ghana think about who is a better alternative to lead the country than the MPP. So what's your comment on that? Maybe those people do not understand elections. Election is no, elections uh, are not determined by the people who vote. They are determined by the people who count and declare. So you can have all Ghanaians voting for you. If the processes for the counting and declaration are wrong, you will never be the president. So those who don't understand elections, they may think that, oh, campaigning is more important than this. I'm telling you, you can be the choice of the people if the systems that are put in place will rig the election before you go to the election. You are wasting your time campaigning. So you must make sure that the right uh, framework of activities that must ensure free and fair elections is put in place first so that when you are going into the election, you know that you are going to look for the votes of people. And when they cast their vote for you, it will reflect in the results. If you don't have a system that will uh, uh, guarantee that, thing, you are wasting your time campaigning. So who counts is more important than who votes? That's yes, who saying. counts and declares. It's more important than who votes. Really? That is the logic. Anybody who understands elections will tell you this. You can vote, do anything, if the results are read. If you vote 10 for somebody, and the person but, but counting that, rights for ta rights that's, thousands. That's interesting, because I, I don't remember the full quote, and I probably will have to show you the mm -hmm. video. I remember mm -hmm. President Mahama speaking mm -hmm. in 2016. Yes. At the time, there was a lot of confusion about the change of logo yes, and accusations yes, against yes, yes, uh, yes. Madame Charlotte. I Jose. remember. I can testify now, to that. Let me quote what I remember him say. Mm -hmm. And if it's, I can actually play the video for you. Recently, a Buhaha over a logo. I mean, how is it that a logo is going to affect the quality of election in this country? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a discourse we need to be splitting heads on. Then he says, quote, I think that our electoral process has inherent safeguards yes. in that any serious political party can ensure that its policies it, that it's policies that make elections yeah. and make sure of his integrity of the election, yeah. according to him. Yeah. End of quote. Yes. That's what Mr. Muhammad is and saying. And I agree with him 100%. But so that's not the you, same thing you just no, said. No, if you have somebody who is assaulting those safeguards. He says they are inherent. The, the, those inherent they safeguards. That inherent means that they come with the thing, so nobody can change it. And that is what is being undermined. The safeguards that are in there, the inherent safeguards has to do with the law, it has to do with the procedures. It has to do with uh, how to capture the voters' register and all those. Those are what constitute the inherent safeguards. He also said, so I believe our problem. electoral commission mm -hmm. continues to be one of the most experienced yes. and the best not only in Africa but in the world. Yes. And has delivered very successful elections in the past. Yes. So, so why? If you have an electoral commission that has uh, achieved this uh, type of recognition and it is reorganized, and then those who come to replace 
uh, who, who find themselves in the reorganized electoral commission do not want to go by anything that has been established in the past. They want to uh, go and begin afresh. It means your description doesn't cover them. Because if somebody, anybody was saying Ghana's Electoral Commission was credible, he wasn't talking about the name Electoral Commission. He was talking no, about the institution. He was, he was talking about the persons, the, the caliber of persons who were there. He was talking about the established procedures that are there. He was talking about the institutional memory that is there. You understand? But, but so that is that what li all of that has gone no, some to of the, the old guys are still there. All of, no, it's not about old guys. All of that has gone to the drain. Let me show you this document. Electoral uh, proposal for electoral reform. Okay, I'll take a break and mm -hmm. I'll let you show me this when we come yeah. back. We're talking to General Mosquito. Mm -hmm. Later on, we'll speak to the EC. They held an IPAC meeting today. NDC thought that the way the meeting was even arranged doesn't work. We'll take his comments and go into the CI, which is lying before Parliament. We'll read your comments as well. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Today we're talking elections in the COVID era. My guest in studio, General Mosquito, he is the General Secretary of the NDC. The party said they would not take part in today's IPAC meeting because the basis for the organization was flawed ab initio. The EC met with the other parties. They decided that they will open the register end of June. They will finish the process by end of July and they will still meet the timetable. We'll speak to the EC later <laughs> on. <laughs> now, I was trying to point out to you that President Mahama at the time, and now yes, President Mahama, yes, yes had said that it appears, in fact, in the fuller version, it's basically saying opposition parties like attacking electoral commissions. And that if you raise doubt about the commission enough, then you can dispute the outcome of the election. What proves that you are not doing the same thing? That you are just attacking the EC because you because want Because the electoral commission we were talking about was a different, completely different electoral commission. It is not, this is not the first time that members of the commission have changed. From um, 2000, from 2000 up to date, every president has had opportunity to replace one or two commissioners, but their processes have remained the same. They have remained focused. IPAC has conducted itself the same way it conducted itself. It is only after this change that IPAC decided to abandon everything that has been established by all the previous. Uh, commissions. And I'm showing you this document because you, you see, uh, we had well, got. What, what is this? This is a proposal for electoral reforms. This is a, a document prepared by IEA, Institute of Economic Affairs, when Jim Mensah was the boss. <laughs> and after the 20, uh, 2012 uh, election, petition. election petition, the judges directed that. We should come together to uh, embark on electoral reforms. So when the Electoral Commission announced that they were receiving proposals for reforms, IEA, together with all the political parties who participate on their program, decided to generate this document as our contribution towards the electoral reforms. The, and you see that there is no time, but you can read through. One of them is the Electoral Commission should conduct sustained and continued voter registration subject to periodic uh, rigorous uh, review, maintain the integrity, and, and then and instead of the one-off registration of voters and so on. So all this laid the foundation for, uh, you know, permanent registration. And these things were all done. I'll give you a copy. So are you saying this has been truncated by the... Completely. It is on, the t on her table. She has thrown it away because... Tell me one thing here that she's not doing. She is changing the voters' register when the recommendation was that we should have a permanent register and then we will be revising it even through continuous voter registration. So that is clear. There's another case where uh, they said the Electoral Commission should be more open and transparent in its relations with political parties and the general public as well as this, uh, in the discharge of their responsibilities to increase public trust and confidence in the electoral process. And many, many of these things are there. In fact, when we concluded, we submitted this, other civil society organizations and many stakeholders across the country also submitted. In all, we had more than 50 submissions. We put all this together into one document, and IPAC appointed electoral reform uh, committee 
to go and review, look at the various submissions and then uh, distill them mm. and bring out what they think we okay. can implement as a, a part of our roadmap. Okay. And we generated that document too. All these things were based on consensus. You see Jim Mensah's signature there, uh, McMenu signing, everybody. IEA, CDD. Was there a timeline for this to be implemented? When we submitted, uh, when we finalized the, 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 the report, mm. we gave it to Electoral Commission. And they also met and brought a timeline and said that, look, some of these things can be achieved internally today. They did those. Some can be achieved by changing some of the laws. Some can be achieved by uh, the development of the ICT infrastructure in the country and so on. So they did a roadmap of implementation. And any time we attended IPAC, they will report on the progress they have achieved. And so... Jim Mensah was part of the organizations that were monitoring the implementation of the process when mm. she was not. Some can argue that that was a was different civil society. Okay, so now. She's an institution and she's seen from inside. So it's not the so same. So we have now come together. You are the only person who has changed. Then the document is there. If you feel now, obviously that. Obviously, the MPP2 would have changed because you said Mr. McMahon was signed. But Mr. McMahon. He doesn't seem to hmm? think that. The EC is of course. We interviewed so, him two so weeks ago. So why why is it that when you 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 negotiate and you issue a communique covering the agreements you have you have achieved for implementation, and then the following day everybody said I don't feel bound by this and they are throwing it away. Okay. So what is the meaning? Let's what is the need the for the negotiations in the first that, place? So let's come to like you have said to you that I get the sense that your opposition to what's going on is not just the structure of the meeting, but there are more core issues. It yep. appears to me that regulation. One of CI 91 mm -hmm. is part of the issue. The what is acceptable for registration, I think, is a problem. I wanted to comment on that because what I see here is that a person who applies for registration as a voter shall provide as evidence of identification one of the following, and there are three options A, a passport, B, a national identification card issued by the National Education Authority, or C, one voter registration identification guarantee form as set out in form one of the schedule that has been completed and signed by two registered voters. And B, by the substitution for sub-regulation 4 of, of 4. So what I wanted you to do, what mm -hmm. is, is there, what is wrong with this? Okay. What, what is the problem? Thank you very what much. What is the problem with this? You were talking about underlying issues. Yes. yes. The underlying issue does not have to do with just this uh, regulation you are talking about. The, under, the major underlying issue is the deficit of trust in the Electoral Commission and their activities. Because they say one thing today, 48 hours later, they will deny having said it, and they will begin doing something else. So how can you negotiate with people like that, who don't show good faith, who don't want to go by their word? The, the regulation you just quoted, I can show you why we have a problem with that. Basically, what it means, what that regulation means is that if you don't have a passport or a voter's register, then you cannot have a, any document as a sole document for registration. And that is a problem. More than, uh, less than a, uh, about a month ago or so, you remember the Electoral Commission constituted some uh, committee of eminent persons mm -hmm. uh -huh. to go and hear us out when there was the, this heat on, on the, whether we should do voters register, new voters register or not. Mm -hmm. And then we held a meeting. An Electoral Commission was asked to come and do a presentation to us. Then. Then they came, and one of the issues that was contentious was the fact that Electoral Commission, we felt that Electoral Commission was going to throw away the data, the existing voters register. And we asked, if you think that the problem is with the equipment, you can buy a new equipment and migrate the data on it. So why are you throwing away the data which you yourself have said that is credible? Mm -hmm. Then in their presentation, this is their document, is the 
Electoral Commission discarding all previous data? Mm -hmm. The answer is no, no, no. The Electoral Commission will use the existing data of voters during the registration of voters into the new voters register. To be registered into the new register, existing voters need to only present their existing voter ID card to the registration officer. So having agreed what upon... What was the date? When was this? When was this, this? was... Uh, this was the PowerPoint presentation they did. Is it March or is it January? I think sure. uh, it, it was around before the, the COVID. We held this, this meeting was when at you were having Coco those meetings Nord about uh -huh, those big uh, eminent persons. I see. So this was what was presented to that meeting, and all the eminent persons accepted it and said that that defeats the argument we're making that they were thrown away a credible register. You understand? Now. <laughs> Less than a month later, you go behind all this and present an amendment CI to Parliament, deleting the very card you had placed here that it will be the, the existing voter registration the existing card. Voters ID card. So that is the problem. And you see, when you are doing uh, identification, you are compiling any list. You must find a form of identification which everybody will submit that will cover majority of the, of the people you intend to register. So that, by all means, they, you will not have 100% coverage of any source document. Because if you have 100% coverage of source document, there will not be the need for registration at all. So what you do is that your source document must cover majority of the persons, and then the, the few who cannot uh, produce a document as prima facie evidence for their registration. You find other ways mm. of capturing them. Now we have a system where we are going into, uh, into registration, and your source document, the breeder document, mm -hmm. is going to cover <laughs> less than the, uh, so, so even my half. estimation, if they go ahead with this, mm -hmm. how many people possibly will be affected? If they decide that they will not use the existing voter card and they'll just use the two and then the other document. You know something? Uh, the, the passport. What is the basis of acquisition of a passport? Is it not uh, I think birth certificate? certificate. Yes. What is the basis of acquisition of uh, and I card. Is it not birth certificate? How can you say that birth certificate is valid? Passport is valid. Uh, you, you are saying that uh, birth certificate is not valid. Passport is valid, which is the product of a birth certificate. Uh, and I card is valid, which is also a product of a birth certificate. But the birth certificate itself is not valid. How can you say that? That is what the law the absurdity okay. in the law that is going to well, be passed. We have a couple of minutes. I just wanted to do two, yes. two, two things. They've made a decision. Mm -hmm. You are still part of the electoral process. Yes. So what's going to be your strategy? Electoral commission's decisions, if they are against the law, they don't apply. I remember there were times when electoral commission had decided to go and do uh, 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 registrate, no, 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 voting at this assembly level. The law had to change. When, the, when there was a ruling that, that that thing is not on, it stopped the Electoral Commission from doing that. So the fact that Electoral Commission just gets up and announcing timetables and so on, it doesn't change anything. So are you if the go law to is wrong, the yeah. law is wrong. We, and we will pursue it to the last letter. But, so but this, I'm just saying practically, whilst you are pursuing that, mm -hmm. the date is still rolling towards December 7th. Yes. So how are you going to balance that? And court cases can take Look, a long time. If the nation does not rise up to take this decision, the Electoral Commission is simply working us into a disaster. Because you are going to have yourself at a point where you cannot postpone the elections. But the activities that should be ready before the election cannot be completed. Because they themselves, in, in, in producing their earlier timetable, when they were even going to start on the 18th of April, they were going to finish and uh, produce the final voters register in the first week of November. Now, two months 
would have been gone two and a half months would have been gone if you are going to uh, register okay. in end of June. Uh, General. And then you are going to do COVID and social distancing, mm. which will slow the process. But the number of people you are going to register has not changed. So why do you think that you can just go and do it in a shorter term and end and the, produce those, a those register? Are good it's, a, it's a problem that we'll, they are we'll, working we'll, we'll on. Ask the EC when we come mm. back after this break. This is still the point of view. My guests in studio, uh, Johnson Asin Ketia, NDC General Secretary. When we come back, we'll speak to the EC and put some of the questions that have been raised to them. Stay with us. Welcome back to the point of view. Tonight we're trying to understand the IPAC meeting that took place, the NDC's boycott, and what transpired there. We are now joined by Dr. Sri Bokweku. He's the director of electoral services at the Electoral Commission. Doc, thanks for joining us on a Point of View. Good evening. Good evening, my brother, and good evening to your listeners, too. So we understand that your IPAC meeting came to some sort of decision that uh, registration will start late June and end late July. What was the summary of the key points about after today's meeting? What happened? Thank you, my brother, and a good evening again to your uh, listeners and viewers. As you are aware, we divided the APAC meeting into two. The first team came at 10 o'clock a.m. The second team came at 2, 2 p.m. The main issue that we discussed were to update them on the registration. So we told them that the commission has decided that ending of June, last week of June, we start the registration and finish at the end of July. We told them that we are using the clustering system as we used in 2012. So this time ran five registration centers or polling stations will constitute a cluster. So what it mean is that a cluster will have a registration team with their BVR and everything. When they go to the first registration center, they'll be there for six days. After finishing the six days, they will have a day rest to retool to. Then they'll move to the second registration center, be there for six days, another day to rest, to go to the third one. The process will continue until they finish with the fifth registration center. Now, by the time they will finish the registration center, since time five, we have given you 30 days, and the rest period will be four days, that will be 34 days. Now, when they finish that, then they will look back and see whether in the course of moving, there were some centers who were not fully covered. Then, that, so they will use the 34th day, 35th day to do that. Once they identify that some areas have still have outstanding people to be covered, then they will use three days to do that. Use the three to use three days to do them uh, uh, mop up so that you know we are going to use 38 days to compute the registration. We also told the, the team that because we are not in normal times, we have been holding meetings with the national COVID team and we have been meeting Dr. Watimba, Professor Dujemfi, and, and Dr. Insia Asari. We have been brief discussing our COVID team, COVID uh, uh, protocols that we want to put in place. So what we have decided is that at the resident center, when you, uh, an applicant gets there, we, every resident center, we are using a, a, a more than 6,300 6, uh, kits or centers, teams. So when you go to any of these 3,300 6, plus teams, there will be thermometer gun. Your temperature will be taken. Once your temperature is taken and you are above the threshold, there will be mobile health team that will call them. They will come to you, uh, have an interaction with you. If there's the need for you to be taken away for federal checks, they will do that. If you are OK, then we move to the main recession center where the fiscal distancing will be observed, that we are going to use paint to demarcate the places so that you, you, you don't jump yourself together. So when you are demarcated, you fall within the demarcated line. And when it is your time, uh, you will also be, there'll be uh, uh, running water, water at the various centers using the Veronica bucket. So once the temperature is taken, then you, you wash your hands with the soap and everything. Then you join the queue based on the demarcated lines. Then once you are turned, you go to the team. We are, we are also coming up with one innovation that we are going to put 
the Form 1As and the guarantee forms on our website. So that before you go there, you could, have, you could download the Form 1A and the guarantee form if you don't have Ghana card or passport. So that you, could, you can compute the Form 1A and the guarantee form with your guarantees. But we are expecting that when you are going to the residing center, you will go with your guarantees. If you have the, the Ghana passport or Ghana card, then you don't need any guarantees. So when you, you, you go there, it is at the center that the guarantee, uh, the guarantees will now endorse it in the presence of the team for them to know that, yes, you qualify to guarantee for them. Once that is done, then you go uh, to the uh, table, your biometric uh, will be taken with respect to fingerprints. Once that is through, your picture will be taken. If you are uh, insisting that anybody going to a center should go in a mask. So then when you go in a mask, when they stand for the picture to be taken, they take off the mask, the picture is taken. Now, middle of the picture is taken, you put on your mask, <laughs> then you are, you are, you are, you are, you are put it and your card is given. On your way out, there will be hand sanitizer and the Veronica bucket at gate, whichever your choice is, you do. We are also saying that for the scanner, which we will be having contact, it's not the scanner that we have contact with applicants. So from whenever anybody's fingers are put on it, immediately you finish, we are using wipes with chemicals to clean it to also mm. avoid the contamination. So all well, these are the steps. So are these are the arrangements. Place. So wh when you spoke to them, what did they say? Did, were, were there any objections? Were there any concerns? No, they, they were happy with what we have put in place. We are going to adopt another no novel by saying that people who are uh, would work for the vulnerable, 65 years, years plus people, people in, in advanced pregnancy, and people with, uh, people with disability. We were thinking that those people can download the documents I've told you, then they would rather go to our district offices instead of going to the field to join the queue. But the parties unanimously said that they were not in support of that. So that's when the commission would take a decision on that. With the exception of the, uh, using the district office as a, as a complement, Mm. To, to cater for the vulnerable group, which was objected to. Okay. All the other things. So, do you, do you have the maximum number of people who can be at a center per time? Do you have an, a number in your head? Yes, we, we are we are thinking that at a point in time within the demarcated area, there should be more than twenty-five, including our people. We are using six people. Will the places be indoors or outdoors? Outdoors. We are doing that outdoors. outdoors. So 25 people maximum. So where will the rest yes. be? So where will the rest of the people be? The area. So the rest. No, so it means that mm -hmm. we, want, we have no. It's like when you have uh, when, when you are voting, the residence and there is the uh, police station is demarcated. You have probably have seen that. So within the demarcated area, that that is the number. But outside the demarcated area, they have to position themselves. Will, so will as, you take people's as, temperatures when they get there? Well, as I said, that I've. All the 6,300 and something uh, residents, every center will have a gun, a gun. That's what I said. So your, 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 your temperature will be taken before you, you, you are uh, allowed to enter into the, mm. the, the market line for you to apply uh, the Yeah, but my, my, so the, the, question then, the question then becomes, our voting reg laws and what qualifies me to register, high temperature is not... A disqualifier. So if I'm 30, I didn't say you are going to be disqualified. So what, what I said that if you are above to me? the threshold, mm -hmm. there will be mobile health team. So the mobile health team will come, will be called to come to your aid. So the based on the interaction with the day, we will advise us the next step to take. Ah, but right. if, I, if I'm so if I'm if I'm hot, and they say I should go to the hospital, does that mean I can't register that day? That wants to be if the health uh, team. Decide that your situation is that you need medical attention immediately. Your health should be more important than your registration. Okay, now let's discuss a few quick points. The, of course, you've spoken about why you decided to divide the team into two. The NDC says that the convention has been one IPAC meeting until you started this in January and March. And you, you, you basically were saying it's because of social distancing. I mean, couldn't you just have one meeting to accommodate all of them at once so that everybody is on board? Did you have to insist on dividing the groups into two? Uh, we all know that we are not in normal times, so we should put in place the 
uh, observing the various protocols. And, but, but that protocol was for only funerals, not for meetings of the EC. Uh, if you listen, Kevin, they said that you can even go to a meet uh, offices and the rest to observe the protocols. Really? Because what I heard the president say was about private burials of 25. He didn't make reference to... to, that to, to everywhere you are, even at your office, you should observe the physical distancing. Is there? So, so it doesn't mean that we are at your office, anybody can come and you be mingling at that. But, if you are at your office... But the question is, you had about... Even. If you even have 25 political parties, you can hold it in a big room for all of them to be there and socially distanced. Did you have to divide them into two? If we, uh, we wanted to hold a meeting within our premises. And you don't have a room that can take all of them into one without being too close to each other? The most important thing is that we want to protect everybody and we wanted to observe the physical... But why, why do you have to hold a meeting in your office? Is your office the only place you can hold an IPAC meeting? That's the choice. Based on what? We, because we want to be in our office and we want to observe the fiscal distance. And that's where we have holding our meetings. Your CI that is in Parliament, when does it mature? The, we have been formed the first week of June. So in terms of the timetable, after first week of June, once it matures, registration starts? We know that uh, the CI, somebody is uh, challenging the other court, so it depends on what the court will say. But if everything goes smoothly, we would have to say by the end of last week of June, we'll start our registration. In but I want to put on record mm -hmm. that whether the CI is uh, allowed to go or not, if Supreme Court says that we cannot amend the CI, we'll go back to the old CI, but the timetable will not be affected. And the old CI includes the old voters' card? Yes. So you are not averse to it. If, it, if, the, if the court doesn't agree, you are still prepared to register with the old... Electoral Commission, Electoral Commission law abiding. I'm asking this because when you met the parties, and I don't know if you can see this document, when you were explaining the biometric voters' register, and this document is what the NDC gave us, they are saying that you, you agreed that you are not discarding the previous data and that you will use the existing data of voters. I said this issue is at the court, so let's leave it there. No, but I was just asking, what, why the change? It is at the court, so let's leave it there. What, what is that? The, the, those questions will be put and we answer them. No, but I just wanted to understand why the change. Yeah, I'm saying that what the question you're asking me is the very thing that somebody has gone, gone to court with. So let's meet uh, at the court, we'll tell, it, we'll tell our story, leave the court. I guess we'll just receive that. Okay. If in, the court doesn't agree. Fair um, enough. So. In, in the initial plan you put out, things were to have started in April. And because of COVID, we are starting in June. And based on our understanding of the April plan, the register would have been ready by November. So now that we've lost two months, how can you convince if, us if that? You've been listening to us. How can you convince us that? We, our prayer that we don't go beyond July. From the word go. That's what we have been saying. So, so long as we are not in July, you are okay. You can. Once, once we don't go beyond July, we, the, our program can conveniently adjust as uh, mm -hmm. uh, could be okay. factored in. So, when we when we finish registration and everything by July, when would the the register be ready? Uh, our intention is that we will finish registration in July. We will do the adjudication of all the processes including the printing of the provision registers in August. Then in September, we'll do the exhibition. Then in October, we'll do nomination. The law is that not less than 90 days. So not more than 90 days and not less than 30 days to the election, we should do nomination. So we can do the nomination 90 days to the, the election, which is 7 December. We can do it 60 days. We can do it not less than 30 days. So mm. we want to go for nomination in October. Mm. Then, God willing, December. You'll be done. With okay. the observation F of all the protocols and the rest, yeah. we'll have the election. Finally, the president, as we speak, has banned all social gatherings. He's going to speak to us hopefully by Sunday. Can I take it that all that you've our, said. Our, our understanding is that it doesn't cover our activities. What do you mean? What he will say or what he has already said? What I'm saying is that 
But our understanding that doesn't cover our, our this is when we get there, we'll plot it. What doesn't cover your activities? What, what you are referring to? No, no, I'm not asking the question. You haven't, haven't asked the question. I'm saying that the president is speaking on Sunday to modify the restrictions. So I'm saying that does it mean that it is when he finishes modifying that you can take off or based, even before he speaks, your, your plan can happen, irrespective of what he says? I don't think that the, all, the, all previous uh, EIs and the red, our understanding that does not have, they do, don't, don't affect our operation. So if, if it is as it is, we can still go ahead. That's our understanding. Oh, okay. So the public ban of gatherings doesn't affect you? That's our understanding. Oh, really? I see. So you, I, I, so why weren't you working? Why, why, why have you waited till now then? If it doesn't affect you, why are we waiting till now? Because you see, the COVID came, it was new, so we needed to do a lot of consultation. We needed to know, like I said, and I don't know what I've said, I think I've said it that we have had a lot of meetings with the National COVID team. I don't know whether it was a center station. You, you, and we have yeah. meeting the National COVID team, headed by Dr. Nsiasari, Dr. Boatimba, and Dr. D, uh, Professor DGMV. So we needed to have a lot of discussion to be sure that we can stay through. But our understanding is that COVID has come to stay. So we already think that we need to take the next step, uh, uh, protocols and mm. them. Final, so, final question, sir. If the public doesn't feel confident enough to come and register, how, how concerned would you be? Because I'm sure as a commission, you want more people to come on. If people don't feel safe enough... Yeah, we, and stay at home, what would that mean for your plans? We are sure that once we do a lot of education, they'll come to appreciate the protocols we have put in place. If you go to most of the uh, shopping malls, the banks, and the rest, these protocols are in place and people are going. So the, the most part that we should do a lot of education for people to know that we are not, uh, we care about their health and all these measures have been put in place to, to protect them. All right. Thank you for talking to us, Dr. Sribo Kweku. We wish you well. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. That was the Director of Electoral Services at the Electoral Commission, uh, Dr. Sribo Kweku. So you've heard it very clearly. June, first week in June, the CI matures. And once that is done, they move. Now, whether the court case goes in their favor or not, if it doesn't go in their favor, they still have the old CI that they can use. So... Essentially, based on the EC's plan, we will have a new register by the time we have December 7 to vote. So I think that that settles it from the EC's part. Um, we'll have to leave it here. I'm sure there will be a lot of debate and questions. We had Jenna Mosquito here earlier on um, making a case for why they didn't attend the meeting and also leaving a whole lot of documents with us, which we try to uh, ask Dr. Kweku to respond to. Thank you so much for watching another edition of The Point of View. My name is Bernard Avle. We'll see you another time. Bye-bye.